Right. Test. How does this look? How do my levels look? Fine, I guess. It's a little quiet. Test this. Talking. I guess it's fine enough. Oh, yeah, you're showing up. It's Chris Ramo, good. podcaster. March 25th, 2015. <laughs> this is Idle Thumbs 203. I'm Chris Remo. I'm Danielle Riendo. And I'm Jake Rodkin. And we're all happy to be here. True. Yeah. I couldn't be happier. I couldn't be happier. Oh, man. I could be happier. <gasps> Sorry. Yeah. Just in, in the style of I couldn't care less and I could care less. <laughs> just try swapping oh, yeah. those occasionally and see uh, which <laughs> see one. What, see I could be happier. Go, you know. Huh. Like, oh, is something possible. wrong? Is, is it? No, I, I could be happier. <laughs> oh, so like there's you, there's Chris. You, I could care less. <gasps> <laughs> so you're saying that you 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 care. Something is being said. There's a lot of I, you know. There's a lot of tension in this room. <laughs> I see the eyes are going. Uh, Chris, let's just put it this way: I'm happy, and I don't care about you. Shit! Oh my god. <laughs> I feel Jake, good about one of those messages. <laughs> I love you. <gasps> Twin Peaks rewatch is seeping into our. I think it is into our existence. Wait, Twin Peaks rewatches or Twin Peaks? Uh, Twin Peaks is. Yeah, I was like, uh, that's a little sneak peek, everyone. Uh, Twin Peaks <laughs> rewatch. <laughs> it's basically Chris and I just professing our feelings for each other to mm-hmm. each other. Yep. Uh, under the auspices been, of a Twin if Peaks you discussion. Picking up on that subtext, I don't know what you've been listening to. Yeah, well, where have you been? I mean, you could have Log Lady, like, I don't know, be there at your commitment ceremony or something. Mm-hmm. You know, she could she could bear the rings on her log, potentially. True. That would be cool. Or, like, on a little sort of, like, stumpy twig yeah, that's, like, got some rings like, on it. Yeah, like, put them on that's a, true. one on each side. Like, there's a stumpy twig on Man, each side. Man, there has been a Twin Peaks wedding for sure. Oh, yeah. Where someone had their friend wear weird old big glasses and bring <laughs> mean, the rings you mean, up. like, in real life? I mean, in oh, real yeah. life. Someone yeah. had a Twin Peaks-themed wedding where... There was like a pillow that had a log oh, on it that I'm had two sure, rings on I'm it. Sure, for sure. I imagine there have sure been multiple. Done that. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Or it's probably like a hinged, like reclaimed chest made out of like a full <laughs> log. A full that log? They, yeah. That's that they, the Twin Peaks 2016 oh, uh, yeah. w- wedding. That's, that's, the, that's, that's the Blu ray case that it th- comes in. That's, that's <laughs> the like, we're, that's the modern. We're reappropriating the imagery of Twin Peaks and making it our own in our wedding. Right. Anyway, what? Artisanal. That's what we talk about on Twin Peaks Rewatch. We talk about Twin Peaks themed wedding planning. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. On this podcast, we fucking talk about video games. I played two video games that were really good this week. I played one video game (laughs) and it was the same one that I have been playing. Is it City Skylines? It is. Oh, my God. It's so good. I played nothing because my <laughs> internet is still fucked because Comcast oh. is cool. Oh, that's really sad. I have to say, I convinced someone to play City Skylines who is not really a gamer, mm-hmm. but this person is the uh, city's editor at Curbed.com. So oh, Vox Media, crazy. it's like our uh, network of websites. Curbed <laughs> is like real estate and city so mm-hmm. on and so forth. You know, what goes on in San Francisco, she's the editor of San Francisco and also cities and she's obsessed with city planning in real life because she yeah. writes about that that's her beat right of course and so she i had a conversation with her today about city skylines and how she should totally play it because she hasn't played a sim city since not 2000 what was kind of in between 3000 or something yeah it was 2000 3004 i and think then, she yeah. played 3000 yeah okay and so she hasn't she hasn't been in the game in a while and i convinced her like you need to play this and i showed her a video nice. of it and she was 
sold. Well, City Skylines, I still haven't played it because my life is bad. <laughs> but we've been talking about this at work a little bit, just about how much actual, like, real urban and civic planning stuff is maybe not accurately, 100% accurately modeled in City Skylines, but is there where, like, you can yes. build sound barriers on your freeways, yeah. where things make noise pollution, where, like, you have to, like, yeah. obviously we've talked okay. about... Huh? Yes, it's so true, To particularly when it comes to traffic and transit management. This game... Which makes sense, right? Because it's from a company that made yeah. traffic sims oh, yeah. and yeah. transit yes. sims. But t- definitely, but I didn't realize how much this game was a traffic... Like, really actually cares about traffic. Yeah. It's like, an, to the point where some people I've noticed have kind of, as a knee-jerk response, kind of talked about how the traffic is broken. It's not. It's just actually not broken. So it feels yeah. broken because it works <laughs> basically how traffic work. Traffic works. It's crazy. Um, I, I, they also, the way that the game starts, I forget if I talked about this last week, but it starts with like, two highway two one way connections off the interstate so like a an you know an inbound off ramp and an outbound on ramp and those are the two roads you have it is totally unintuitive to me just as a person who doesn't know anything about like traffic design or city planning or the, the interstate system beyond just what any one of the driver's license knows it is totally unintuitive to me how, how to take those and integrate them like in the sort of yes. quote proper way, yeah, in a graceful <laughs> way into a city. Can you can plan. you hook up to that freeway in other ways later in the game, or is it the yeah only- yeah yeah yes you can like especially because in this game you can continue buying more plots of land beyond the one you start with. So like anything that's in your a plot of land that you own, regardless of whether you built it or whether it was so already you can there, eventually take over is, management of that freeway, for instance. Yeah, you could just Pretty erase much, it yeah. if you wanted to. I mean, you could erase it within the bounds of the right. plots of land you own, and like you could reroute it in a different direction. You could do whatever you want, but that's that that's like I was beyond the no, no, totally. But like just the sort of simple, what exactly? Like this is such a specific design that they present. Like the choice of that being how to connect your city to something is so specific and so. They like, must have unusual. done it. They must have done it because it looks like. SimCity 2013 starting thing, except that in this case, it's an actual functioning off-ramp and on-ramp. Yeah, I mean, I don't yeah. think they did it just because it looks cool. Yeah, I think they did it because it's... Well, it's familiar. It's how you hook up a city in Sims in the last SimCity. Like, that's what oh, you're was given. Oh, did it work that way as well? Because the, interstates, two separate lanes, the interstates in SimCity were not simmed. Those mm-hmm. were the like the, the the sort of the artery between your different sort of sub cities. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I don't know if it was if it was actually stemmed as an off ramp and an on ramp, but it was the ingoing and outgoing lanes aesthetically sure. turned of into one those road, ramps. Though, sure. right? Well, I think it's split in the art at the art level onto freeway ramps. But then, yeah, you could yes, just you could I, just paint yes, one fat not, road. Yeah, but that's not what this is. This is like two actually separate one way. You can't roads. merge those onto one fat road? I mean, you you can, but it's like, is that what you're supposed to do? Why, why do they – if so, like, why do they present them this way? Why don't they just do that for you? So, like, they I must guess that's be... true because what, what actual cities do for their freeway on-ramp and off-ramps is they then split them and put a road in between them or one of them sort of loops mm-hmm. around off on the other yeah. side of the yeah. freeway exactly. and all sorts of crazy right. shit. So I found, a, I found a YouTube video from this guy, this, like, Canadian guy who's been doing this big series of um, – you know what? I should find his username because he's really excellent. Uh, who has been doing uh, City Skylines videos every few days. And one of them, which is the one that I really needed, was like, here's an example of how to actually use this in a really sophisticated way. And he actually gets totally into it where a huge percentage of his streets are one way streets and like little bypasses and overpasses and underpasses and. Um, like really clever routing to like he he except in kind of slow residential areas he really strenuously tries to avoid 90 degree intersection he he builds like merging intersections on one-way streets so that traffic doesn't have to like back up waiting at a light they can just smoothly merge together it's fascinating like it is the the degree of care that this guy brings to just like every little intersection and planning choice is incredible. Like it's actually really interesting to watch. And I kind of wish that that video was decoupled from the, like, 
here's how to play the game. Cause he also was like, here's what zoning is. And I'm like, I'm oh, not sure. here because yeah. I need to know what zoning is. <laughs> I'm here cause I need to know what the fuck crazy, like road sorcery you're, you're doing <laughs> to create this like amazing. Cause he ends up with a thing that both looks way more convincingly like an actual, um, sort of city connection to an interstate or an interchange. Um, and also is like totally functional in the context of the game. But you have to be really careful that you don't create – that you don't accidentally build things in an area that you can't actually get to from your residential zone because yeah. it's too far back, to closer to the – like if you build a lot with one-way roads, it's possible to have areas that can be zoned but that can only be reached from the highway directly. You can't go back to them because they're past the point of no return where the one-way street like turns yeah. into a two-way street or, or yeah. an intersection yeah. or something. So. I don't know. It was really interesting. So I, what I ended up doing was I had with a dual monitor setup, I ended up just running his YouTube video after I'd already watched it once through and just been totally captivated by it. I loaded it up on my other monitor and then loaded the game on my main monitor and just followed along. It was like doing a, a tutorial for like professional software, you know, like when you're sure, yeah. following along or with like, like learn unity or something. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was like doing, doing a video tutorial for actual, a real thing. Except it was for this video game, but it was really fun. Like I was That's following awesome. along and like changing yeah. things here and there. And like it helped me absorb some of these principles that I don't think I ever would have. It never even would have even occurred to me to think about this stuff. Because I built a huge, I built a city that's not huge compared to what some people have built, but was like, you know, 50, 60,000 people just by playing these games the way I always do, which is just kind of make every new thing as it comes like as there's more demand keep making stuff and like sprawl it out and try to mix it up and not just have it be a straight grid but like not really plan it that carefully just kind of go yeah. uh, and everything's two-way streets i don't think i used a single one-way street in that entire city um and uh and it was still really fun like i had a blast of, of a time doing it um but you were ready for the next level basically well yeah because i he because, was offering because that city yeah. was a traffic nightmare sure you know yeah. what i mean like yeah. the 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 road going to and from my industrial area i had a few roads but one of them was the only road anyone wanted to use and it was just backed up for like miles on the highway oh, i mean just like you would just see trucks just backed up waiting to to get into my city it was crazy um cuz i just hadn't thought of any of this stuff and i would build things right up to the highway you know so sure. like created these worsened existing problems um, anyway, I love this fucking game. I love that so it's like, good. Yeah. did you, have you guys seen the imager series posted by the guy who is an actual like traffic scientist or city planner or something no. like actual real guy. And he's, he's like, Hey everyone, here's uh here's some basic principles of traffic management. Like that I applied so cool. to like my city of Victoria in city skylines. And it's just this huge series where he demonstrates all these principles of traffic control in like his in actual, actual city game. that he yeah. yeah and the game totally responds to those things in an appropriate way God, it's so incredible yeah it's completely when i awesome. first started playing this game i just felt like this is a very good competent that's what i thought well too. designed sim city yeah, clone yeah. you know and then as i dug deeper and i'm not i'm not on the level where you are either like at this point even i i'm still having problems with power and some basic things but i'm able to appreciate just how mm -hmm. deep this runs and yeah. it's really incredible mm -hmm. like this it feels like this game kind of came out of nowhere in a lot of <laughs> regards yep it seems like i know it really did come from nowhere too yeah. I, I mean i'm sure to people who follow this stuff it didn't yep. but to me it did yeah I okay also, sorry real, i'm sorry oh. Jake, real quick i just want to read the name of this guy his account in case you're interested is to vlogs so like to as in toronto which i guess is where he's from and then V L O G S. That's his YouTube account. Sweet. Awesome. Yep. Well, all, all I was going to say is, I I know that a lot of people who are like really diehard, old, long running SimCity fans were really not into this SimCity, or into into City the, Skylines. No, into into SimCity, SimCity. Oh, into Max's the last, into the most recent oh, SimCity that Max yeah. has made, the yeah. 2013 SimCity. Um. And. As a person who was completely lost by SimCity 3000 and SimCity 4, I was really glad that the Max of SimCity stripped stuff down. It just stripped it down way too much. Right. But this game seems like it has a bunch of insane things in it, but because it has a lot of that sort of aesthetic and functional foundation and the one-to-one -one representation of trucks and cars and mm -hmm. people yeah, that, and whatever that's else. That's the part that is so incredible to I, me. I, th I yeah. think that the, this game is allowing a lot of people 
it seems like it's allowing a lot of people to very quickly start appreciating it the way that really diehard people appreciated the older SimCity games. Yes, absolutely. And one thing I, I, I do want to say on its behalf is that as much as I love that the game models all this traffic stuff as well as it do, does, I was still able to make a totally functional and profitable city without paying attention to that. It just clearly sucked for the virtual people driving around. <laughs> but yeah. like it didn't it, – it's not like the city failed because of that. Yeah. It was just – I probably didn't grow as fast as I could have be probably because my imports and exports weren't being like, you know, I probably wasn't, wasn't earning nearly as much yeah. money as I could have right. for that reason. But like the city totally worked. I was in the black and like I. So do you still have that city? Because yeah. now that you know uh-huh. more stuff about traffic management, you can actually run that city. Excuse me. You can <laughs> it's actually okay. run that city as an experiment because the way that your city is built right now. Because it's just sort of you just hodgepodging out some grids and some other stuff. is probably the way that like. A city that was, like, just a small random town, not a suburb, not a big city, but just, like, a farm town or an industry town in the middle of America that then found itself growing in a right. weird way in the, yeah. 70, in the 70s through yeah. the 90s and yeah. went from, like, a 20,000-person town to a 50,000, 60,000-person town. Right. They, they have all of the problems, I bet, that your town has. <laughs> yeah. So now that you know what you know about city skylines, you could probably go like in as, clean house. as the enlightened urban right? <laughs> planner and actually try to fix all of the problems yeah. of your previous sim. Well, you know what's funny That's is that I, I kind of tried to do that sort of kind of in that same city where I just I bought a, like a plot of land just way off, went like a couple miles down the highway and then paused the game built an entire new town from like during <laughs> while it was yeah. <laughs> so I like I laid down all the roads built all the utilities uh built all the services like police and uh like fire you and just built sewage a better planned community yeah. down the, down the road from yeah. the shitty one I built schools <laughs> uh I zoned everything, so there's no one there because I have to like come and, z- and build in real time. Yeah, you but like, built a weird Disney city. Yeah, yeah. I basically you made celebration. Like, Stepford wived my. You <laughs> know. Right. So then, just everyone time froze for all your residents. Then they went, ah! and just there was a full, empty, perfect city waiting for <laughs> right. you just down the freeway. Yeah. Did everyone it- move? No, because ironically, um, I have this like now incredibly overeducated population who refuses to work anywhere but like high-rise oh office buildings like my my uh my <laughs> made San Francisco. Yeah, my industrial community is in like a total crisis in that city because the workers are all overeducated and people like don't want to work there um and so i made this new city and i'm like oh this is going to be like a peaceful community that's all low density housing and like low density everything no one wants to live there because they're all these like affluent overeducated city people so like almost nobody basically nobody nobody's moved in. happy yeah it was like it was it was a, i meant just widen the roads and add some one-way streets i know stuff. what you meant but i'm describing what i actually did <laughs> yeah what you did was a mistake uh sorry danielle earlier you you were talking about showing this game to your friend who runs curb yeah she's the city's editor so did she actually end up playing it yet or is it just is it no just it was just like during so the work day okay. kind of thing you know i told her because she said she had you know, heard about this game and that, you know, people were playing it and people had like recommended it to her because they know she's really into city planning in real mm-hmm. life and like yeah. very interested in this. You have to thing. make her actually play this game so you can report back. I think I want to. I think I should probably, I should stream it with her or something yeah, just to see great. how she likes it. Yeah, because yeah. like the thing that I will never do but want to do is make my dad play it because he is, mm. he is, uh, oh, yeah. he's an acoustical engineer who does like, he works on city's general plans about noise pollution and like, that's awesome. New development and how all mm-hmm. of the weird atmospheric things affect yeah, them. Noise pollution is one of the major factors to ha- citizen happiness in this game. I know. I feel like he would be excited by that fact, but I have to actually play <laughs> of the game myself before I show it to him. Right, but I'm not course. like, oh, and then, uh, uh, well, you got, uh maybe you quit sorry, this. I'm feeding everyone poop. Hold yeah. on. Like, you know, I, I got to get past that phase. Poop water. My dad. God, yeah. there was an amazing. People, as expected, people have been publishing incredible, like, image essays, like, screenshot essays yeah. uh, about their amazing cities and experiences in this game. And there's one, you can look it up, it was called uh, Hullchester, like, H-U-L-L-C-H-E-S-T-E-R, uh, the two-part series on Im- Imager, which I guess is just where people put stuff like this now. Um, and it was just about this town that was basically, everything about this town basically revolved around this d- big dam that like in in increasingly complex ways and the city has a very predictable fall but like the <laughs> sure but the, sure, the like yeah. the road to the fall of this city is fascinating and the aftermath of it is like pretty pretty great oh, that's awesome. so yeah holchester look it up it's good 
It's a good read. I really like slash um, look. Oh, it's a good look. Yeah, it's yeah. a good look. <laughs> it <was laughs> it's a, a good bad scroll. Look, ultimately, it's a good scroll, but a bad look. Um, I've just been I've been having fun sort of downloading other people's cities and looking at them. I haven't done any of that. Bit. I haven't downloaded any mods. I haven't downloaded anything yet. For yeah, this there's game. just well, because I'm not great at it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're a city skyline tourist. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of a. Are tourist. you downloading those from just websites, or can people actually it's upload right entire the- cities to? The Steam Workshop. I'm pretty sure you can just upload oh, entire cool. cities because, you know, when I was looking at stuff, even before all all of it, all the functionality was yeah. necessarily in place, like there were already some pre-built mm-hmm. cities that I was looking at and being like, oh, right. look, you can make bus lines with different colors and oh my God. getting excited all that about that. stuff is so cool. It's really Also, good. Jake, you will love this. People are uh, people have uploaded like improved UI. There's like a improved UI for the transit system where you can like toggle visibility for like individual transit lines within like buses for example and like all these cool things that um the developers are apparently already taking cues from like after that mod went up they implemented like some of that stuff into the game not all of it but like that's so i don't know it's it's cool it's that's awesome yeah it's all great that's what i like on the ui tip oh have either of you guys made a map on the terrain height map that you can download of snoop dogg's face (laughs) (laughs) not yet sure haven't you get a nice height map of like Snoop Dogg. So no, you would make like Doggy Town. Or something. No, I, I guess. I mean, if that's what you, you call want. it, whatever you want. Yeah, probably by the time all that shit goes on top of it, it is not is no. Although, it's, right, but that's you, a, then, no that's good, then the secret of your city is that um, <laughs> when, yeah. when, when, when the Earth Dog's reclaims face. it, it's Snoop Dogg's face. This is actually what you have to do: is you have to like on top of the sort of height map generated terrain, you have you build your city until you have the ability to zone high density and then you have to like allocate your low and high density residential commercial and industrial which all have different like maximum heights right for what low and high density is i guess i guess there i guess high density industrial is office buildings but like then you re you like double down on that height map by like wherever the height map is a double extruded build all his buildings oh my god so so you end up so then your city probably just looks normal from an angle but then you kind of like bring it to a sort of if isometric you get the right view, yeah. shot, basically. And then, yeah. then you have to turn on, like, I, I, does it have any of the visualization modes in this to turn the city monochromatic? Like, can you, are there any modes that pull the color out of the world at all? Yes. There's because then noir, you there's would like definitely, noir, you yeah. would, yeah, if you go to the water view, then you would fully reveal. Uh, <laughs> snoop. The, yeah, the secret Snoop. <laughs> secret Snoop City. National Treasure 3. <laughs> <laughs> National Treasure 3. <laughs> Oh my God! Is it National Treasure? Is that it what is. those stupid things are called? Yeah. Yeah. My, my oh, the city's built up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nicholas Cage is. discovers that, that Washington D.C. is actually <laughs> built on like a, a like bas relief of Snoop Dogg. <laughs> <laughs> if we, if, if you know, because in that That's movie, so I'm sure that the urban planning department basically has Sim City visualizations for the entire city. We're like, let's look at the water grid. <laughs> Oh my god. It's a <laughs> shitty Snoop. bad photo extrusion of Snoop Dogg <laughs> and the bottom corner is a big fat blunt. How stupid. <laughs> yeah. I feel like National Treasure that's not too far off, you know. Once it once National, National Treasure, Treasure continues six. on as a DVD yeah, exactly. straight to DVD uh <laughs> series that doesn't start Nicolas Cage. Yeah. Nicolas Cage's cousin, Johnny uh, they, Johnny that's Cage. That's just what yeah. it is. <laughs> featuring Johnny featuring Cage. Featuring Johnny Cage. Uh, Johnny Cage. <laughs> Mortal Mortal Kombat. Kombat. That's not an <laughs> featuring. It's not okay. It's not well, Johnny he's Cage. He's a movie star. It's the mocap it's, it actor works. who played Johnny Cage. <laughs> oh God. I feel like that man's name is actually at the tip of my tongue. I can actually what? picture him. I can picture that guy, and I can picture the making of Mortal Kombat video wow. where he's trying to do a split on like concrete, and they had to go in and like put dust or something. Not dust, but like chalk. On the concrete, so he could do a split more smoothly for the actual for the mocap sessions for that original game. That is game. a specific what? deep pull of knowledge. I I have a lot of Mortal Kombat love from my right. from being ten. No, basically. for sure. If from you're being ten a, years if you're old, you're gonna make a National Treasure sequel, and you replace Nicolas Cage. You have to replace him with French Stewart from Third Rock from the Sun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh man, the reason that I think that is because he's the person who replaced Matthew Broderick in the Tarek the Video Inspector Gadget sequel. Oh my god, he really? really? I'm, 90, I'm, not gonna, no- I'm not gonna look that up, but I bet that's the case. <laughs> oh my god. Um, either way, he's, he should clearly be the guy. Um, also, Netflix is apparently right. like bringing back Inspector Gadget. What? I saw an ad for this on Netflix recently. Really? Yeah. Weird. I know. 
That's... I don't even know if it's a cartoon or live action or what. I mean, the cartoon was far superior. Man, maybe the live action. That was my favorite maybe show. Maybe the was replaced Don was Adams with Fred Stewart. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> Starring Fred. It's now you know instead of just. Uh, Inspector Gadget, it's Inspector Gadget, starring French Stewart. That's actually part of the title. Well, it used to star Don Adams. It used to star I know. Maxwell Smart. Of yeah. I know. I'm yeah. sure I've said this on the podcast before, but I remember I was separately, as a kid, a huge <laughs> fan of... Oh, yes. We've talked about oh, yes, Get Smart and Gadget Inspector Gadget. And Get Smart. And my, when my dad told me it was the same guy, my head fucking exploded. <laughs> like, I could not... That was, like, the most astonishing piece of knowledge that I had gained oh. in my life to that point. City That's Skylines incredible. mods... Um, apparently City Skyline has, obviously someone made this immediately because you can mod it. It has a first person mod. Ooh, inclu- yeah, yeah, yeah. Including a fly camera, which then someone used to recreate, uh, oh, the, the like Los Santos. And then they recreated the trailer to GTA five. Right. Just oh, shot for awesome. shot with all the camera. Moves. Obviously not the characters, but all the yeah, vehicles yeah. and terrain. It looks yeah. accurate. I know. That's like, crazy. awesome. It yep. looks in some ways better than GTA three on the PS2 does. Except <laughs> that it's close ups of a city simulator. Anyway, whatever. That's uh, I love things like that about. I imagine someone has there, made a mod. Talented like, people can who can you do just weird waz and mouse look around through your town from the from street level. No, you can't go in that far. There's got to be a mod that lets you do it, though. Oh, I'm, sure, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm not talking about it officially. I'm, I'm oh, about, oh, yeah. No, I'm sure there's a mod that lets you do that. Yeah. Because because there's that first person one. Yeah, but and uh, you, you yeah. can go pretty. There's, close. there's some great detail though. Like if you watch yeah. like big top heavy trucks, um, like speed around. Sort of shallow they intersections, like they lean. Yeah, like it's there's a lot of nice little what a, attention. You can to read the little posters on the little restaurants and things like mm-hmm. that. You can go close enough to do that. Also, this game was made in Unity. Yeah, like that's in the, the last part, week. Yeah, of this whole thing. City Skylines and Ori in the Blind Forest both came out and were made with Unity. That's astonishing. It was amazing. Two or three weeks ago now, but whatever. Yeah. This month. Yep. Like Unity takes a lot of hits for sort of. Everything looks the same in Unity, which people say about every game engine always. But sure. like those two games are about as far well, yes. as I mean, far yes, apart the, the, on the spectrum as the you The thing get. about Unity as an engine, I mean, yeah, everyone says accurately what Unity loves to make is just stupid mobile games, you know, like whatever it makes, like you use it for really simple stuff. That's true. But the thing that, that even that sort of criticism leaves behind by leaving it implicit and unspoken is that Unity doesn't have an agenda as a game engine. Whereas Unreal has an agenda, CryEngine has an agenda. Yeah, you know, like those those engines are built primarily to make one specific type of game, and people make other things with them. But it's through hacking the fucking shit out of them. Mm-hmm. Whereas Unity is just Unity like, didn't start as an internal tool for yeah. A Unity game just developer. says, oh, you want to move a camera and some objects around? I can do that really easily for you. Mm-hmm. Anything else is just kind of genericized, yeah. and it sh- <laughs> it ships with some like basic character controllers, third that and first to, person yeah. controllers and stuff. But yeah. like. That stuff is pretty bare bones. Yeah, yeah it's very, it's not very it's not simple. like pressing play on the default Unreal thing and just basically getting just Gears having, of War guy, right? Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. or Unreal tournament or Unreal tournament, tournament guy. On which one you have, yeah. yeah. Um. So yeah, it's but it's if if you are a Unity employee right now, you're probably feeling pretty pretty like chuffed <laughs> with this week's or this month's notable sort mm-hmm. of indie game output. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, yep. Absolutely chuffed. It's what? crazy that Unity draws that much stuff also. Like, I'm surprised just that the cities of the scope that they are are able to be rendered inside of Unity in a yeah, way that is performant. It's, yeah. It's really cool. Game of the month. Maybe. I, I mean, don't know. It's the only game really I've have. played in oh, this go- month. Go- so go- go- for me, go- it is that. <laughs> for you, it is your yeah. game of the month. Yep. Yeah, fair enough. Yep. I have two other Godem possible. Yeah. Possible candidates. These games have been certified Goat Impossible. Possible. <laughs> yeah, goat like, Impossible. Go- yeah. That's a different game. That's, That's a different Inspector Gadget. That means these uh, can never be the sequel. game of all time. Oh, no. They, they're, these games are oh, the, no. possibly the best games of the month. Definitely not the best games of all time. Definitely, oh not, the, definitely not the goat. No. Not the official goat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's impossible. <laughs> but the tiny goat. The, mm-hmm. the baby goat, yeah. perhaps. The, goat, goat the goat's kid. Goat oh, impossible. I finally realized what you're saying. Goat Impossible. Goat, goat Impossible. Goat, goat Impossible. Goat impossible. So yeah. Good. Okay, good. Very good, Chris. Goat you did it. Thanks, Jake. You did it. You did it. I like your jokes. <laughs> I appreciate them. What are these, what are these 
Go to So I've played uh, a smaller game called Discourse, which okay. is from Alchemy Labs. They made Smuggle Truck and Snuggle Truck. Oh, right, yeah. And uh, Jack Lumber, I think, was their second game. This is entirely different. And then I will just tell you the name of the other game, and you guys can tell me which one you want to hear about first. Okay. And then maybe we can take a break, and I'll tell you about the other one. Okay. Okay. Bloodborne. Played a lot of Bloodborne as well. We should do Discourse first and then take a break and then do Bloodborne. That yeah. sounds super sounds great to And me. then do Ritter Mail. Yeah. And then go home. That's sounds this, great. This sounds like a great plan. Sounds like this is going to keep getting better and better. Ah, I'm loving it. Well, but then I'm going to go home to an apartment with no internet and inability to play CD Skylines Aww. or Ori and I'll just <laughs> be sad. I'm so sad wow. for you. That's actually very, yeah. I have a sucks. Mac Mini at home um, and it, it it is kind of a media server, but right now... The only real unwashed thing that it has uh, is like three seasons, the last three seasons of Murder, She Wrote. So <laughs> <laughs> Basically, like it had, it, had, it had some TV shows that Dana and I follow, um, <laughs> but then like we've now gone two and a half weeks without internet, so we ran out like in the first week oh, of like the no. two or three shows we've been following, but on a whim... I grabbed like the entirety of Murder She Wrote when it fell off of Netflix like years ago. So now we've watched three seasons of Murder She Wrote. Uh, just oh, on and off, and so like good. over dinner, let's just watch two episodes of Murder She Wrote. The next day, let's watch oh, two more murder sh- murders she wrote. <laughs> murders she wrote. Oh Have wow! Have you seen the, the the first episode of Murder She Wrote? Yeah, but I saw it like three or four years or two years ago when we started I saw watching that it several months ago because. Sarah had never seen Murder, She Wrote. And you and Dana and fucking everyone else were always talking about fucking Murder, It's she not wrote. a good show, <laughs> but it's like, a great show. And I was like, I had yes. seen like a few episodes like when I was a kid or whatever. And Sarah had never seen any of it. So I'm like, oh, we'll just watch the first one. <laughs> it's just like long and boring and has nothing to do with I know. what Murder, She Wrote with was like. Else, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not even in Cabot Cove. Oh, only like half the episodes are in Cabot Cove. The other ones are about oh, her being I a because tra- she's a famous novelist who solves murders, so she just right. travels all over the place. She does, well, in the she first episode, she's like, be- she isn't yet one. So she has to like go to New York, and there's like a publishing guy, and it's like, yep. what is this? <laughs> Why isn't she solving a murder? It's very top that, heavy. Yeah, that pilot plays like a bad movie. <laughs> yeah, it does because it's long. It's like two parts, maybe, or like yeah. extra long. Or anyway, something. we can't get too far into the Murder She Wrote pilot. <laughs> but one thing that is amazing to me about Murder She Wrote, especially the first like that show has like twelve seasons, but especially like the first seven or so seasons of which I have seen many episodes, is how much of those shows take place in like the ultimate high society of like the early eighties. Yeah, that was yeah. also I think where I it's this weird entirely. sort of like it's the gross like neo neo classical rich look of the eighties where there's just yeah. columns everywhere and everyone has too many shitty gold buttons on their jacket and stuff. It's just <laughs> yeah, like, it's like just gross. Like buffant hair. Really oh, quaffed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, super quaffed. You can yeah. just smell the old and lady like perfume. golf pants. Yeah, like, every, oh, it's, golf it's like pants. golf pants and like hardwood wainscoting with shitty vases. Oh, right. Just like gold yeah. buttons and sailor hats yep. everywhere. Oh, it's yeah. so oh gross. God. <laughs> and then Angela Lansbury just in the middle it's of all of it. It's definitely like 80s yacht culture for sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. It is, it is fully, yeah. It is just like life aboard an 80s yacht where everyone is murdered. Yep. Yep. Oh. But that show, like I think it films on location all the time. It's, cr- it's a crazy show. I don't understand yeah. how it exists other than I guess like World War II vet era or, like uh, – <laughs> Have been 10, 15 years retired audience must have been just affluent as fuck and bought and like Murder, She Wrote just commanded a high budget. It's yeah. very strange. I guess. My grandparents ate that show up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I used to watch it all the time with my grandma, but Golden Girls was our thing. Okay. We, but, uh, but there was Golden definitely Girls. a little bit of, yeah. you know, okay, okay, Murder, She Wrote okay, so as well. On this podcast, all we talk on about is podcast. City Skylines. The game Danielle has played and things we watched at our grandparents' house as kids. Um, <laughs> I think it's a great episode. And that's also loves last it. week's episode. That's true. That is true. Well, hey, Bloodborne's a game. Oh, sorry, Discourse Don't is a game. Don't even start on Bloodborne. I yet. will later. Okay. Don't you worry. There'll be Bloodborne talk. Blood will be born from my body. No, it won't. That would be gross. Discourse. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Discourse, spelled D Y S C O U R S E, uh-huh. is a. Let's see. <clears throat> A dysentery sort simulator. of a, well, it's a survival game. It's a cartoon style third person survival game where the, almost the entirety of the gameplay is making decisions about uh, how to survive on a desert island with other characters and, and comfort them what and talk of, to them. What sort of decisions do you make? Make decisions about who should go try to find clean water or who should go try to look at the mm. wreckage of a of an airplane and who should, if somebody gets injured, who should watch the person who's injured? Things like that. 
So it's a little bit like Gods Will Be Watching, like that the okay, ver- the right. early version of Gods Will Be Watching, the uh-huh. like the Chrome. There was an er- there was a very I early like it it was browser screen. version of it, yeah, okay. which which was a bit like this. Um, Did you play? Uh, I mean, this. If you're comparing it to Gods Will Be Watching, that this might this comparison might be not correct. But did you play that game, Zafe House Diaries? No, I didn't. Okay, because that was a game where it was like a survival zombie thing, and very graphically limited. And mainly, you were like directing people where to go and like who's going to stay on watch and who's going to explore yeah, this room. And conceptually, so it's it's pretty yeah. similar to that. Only yeah. you're you're it's very bright and cartoonish. Actually, mm-hmm. like it it has a very distinctive visual style. It looks like Alchemy made it. What's it I called guess. again? Discourse. Discourse with a Y. Yeah. Yeah. With a Y. Um, it's, so it's, it's Alchemy Labs. Yeah. Like I said, they're the folks who made Smuggle Truck a few years ago. Um, and they've been making sort of mobile games ever since. This is their first game, like on Steam, I think. Okay. Um, at least as the team that they are now. Um, I'm really enjoying it so far. I've only played maybe an hour of it or so. Uh, gotten pretty far into the story, gotten a lot of people killed, you know, like, yeah. like I do. Uh, but it, it, you know, there are a lot of decisions to make, and the writing is pretty good. I mean, there some characters are better written than others. They're certainly sure. heightened and cartoonish. You yeah. know, there's a couple, like a middle aged couple, uh, that has some strife between them in their relationship. There's a paranoid guy. There's a guy who's like a gamer and he doesn't know what he's doing and things like that. So it is like, do you know how much of it is is simmed versus how much of it is just like actually a ton of a ton of like prescribed branching? I Not that I carry. I think away. it's a ton of branching. I think it's it's crazy. Tons and tons and tons of branching. And they, so it's like, could this thing actually just be a twine game that has art on top of probably. it? Probably. I mean, not, not, yeah. not literally that, but I mean, like yeah. you could play this through that kind of ninety percent of it. Yeah, because huh. otherwise, you, there's certainly sequences that aren't they're not exactly action sequences but you are sort of walking your character around looking at at objects and and sort of picking things up doing things like that but for the most part you're just walking to people and making decisions (laughs) like text-based sort of decisions um they the figure uh they told us what the figure was for how many like lines are in this game it's some crazy number which makes me think it's a ton of branching stuff basically right (laughs) um so it's really fun. It's really colorful and and interesting. Again, I I can't give like a full opinion on it thus far because I'm only an hour in. But you didn't beat it. I I think I'm close to the game beating me actually because I think <laughs> I only have a couple of people alive at this point right uh, now. But but I'm enjoying it quite a bit. Nice. It's That's a, cool. it's an interesting little game. I think it's out uh, today as of the day this podcast comes out. So cool. I believe on Steam, you know the usual Steam platforms, PC, Mac, Linux. Nice. And now for a break, I guess? Yeah. I don't know. Why not? Let's take a break. All right. Video game. Chris. Jake. Danielle. Jake. I hear that you've been enjoying delicious snacks recently. I have been. I was in the New York office, Polygon's New York office, and there was Nature Box snacks galore. And I ate so many Big Island pineapples that my tongue started to hurt. Did Those you are, know that this episode is brought to you by Nature by Box? By Nature Box. Oh, my God. I will say I that I figured that. I, <laughs> <laughs> I was asking Danielle, Jake, well, please. I, I just have to say, legitimately, I enjoyed quite a bit of Nature Box's any hearty come, goodness. come to mind? Uh, the Big Island pineapples are big. Pineapple oh, yeah. coconut bars We're all were about also those good. on this, this <sighs> podcast. They were... There was an entire, uh, like, a, a, a bucket of them, basically. Like, a, a nicely put together bucket <laughs> of NutriBox snacks that were right there in, in the office's little kitchen. And I, I indulged quite a bit. So NatureBox is a delicious snack subscription service that will bring all these treats that we're talking about to your home or Danielle's office. And then oh, yes. from there to your mouth. Yes. You, mouth? you will bring them there. This, they will bring them to you. It's up to you to bring them into your mouth. But it'll be easy because they, they look appealing as well as taste good. Yeah. Uh, and if you go to naturebox.com slash thumbs, you can get uh, for a very low shipping charge a free sampler pack that comes with four um, kind of trial size uh, Nature Box snacks as well as a full sized Nature Box snack of your choosing. Ooh. They're delicious. You might as well go do it. Naturebox.com slash thumbs. It costs you like two bucks. Yeah. Think about that. A bunch of snacks show up for basically no effort. Five snacks for just like shipping something to you. And then you can eat them. 
Mm-hmm. Then you can be like us and like Danielle, just just chomping on pineapples, just eating food all day, <laughs> delicious snacks. Nature box. Thank That's you nature very box. much. Oh, don't mention it. Video games. This podcast is also brought to you by Audible. Ooh. The yeah, the leading provider of audiobooks on the internet. They have 150,000 titles, actually probably a lot oh. more than that. Yes, they have pretty much any audiobook that you can find. Um, and if you go to audiblepodcast.com slash thumbs, you can get a free trial of Audible membership and awesome. you get to a, keep a free book. audiobook that is yours to keep. I, yep. would, I would like to recommend, Please recommend. Infinite um, Jest by yeah. David Foster Wallace, an excellent book that I am currently... Reading and enjoying quite a bit. It's it's probably a bit of a heavy. Um, well, it's a heavy book. It's a heavy book. So that yeah. has got to be a beefy, <laughs> it's a be beefy, a beefy audio, audio read. <laughs> uh, Audible features Infinite Jest, uh, narrated by Sean Pratt, fifty six hours and fourteen minutes on a bridge. I believe it with yeah. all the footnotes. I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Right and I wonder how the footnotes work in audio form. That's We're fascinating. True, please, true. Wait, hold on, hold on. please note. When you purchase this title, the accompanying reference material, including endnotes, will be available in your My Library section along with the audio. Oh, excellent. So you get so, to read the footnotes as you go. Strange. Interesting. That's, that's, that's cool, pretty though. cool. That's got to be a good solution to that. Yeah, Yeah. no. Infinite Jest. It's a I, hell of a book. I have not yet read Infinite Jest. Maybe I'll listen to Infinite Jest. You should. What a strange... This well, be, you have no this internet. Would be a gra- this would <laughs> oh, be yeah. a great like, epic undertaking to just listen to this over the course of many weeks. Yeah. I think that would be – this is an amazing book, by the way. I've also read yeah. it, and it's, like, really incredible. Um, so audiblepodcast.com slash thumbs, free trial, free book that is yours to keep Free forever. copy of Infinite Jest. True. That's right. That's right. True. If you want a free you copy it, of Infinite Jest on audiobook, audiblepodcast.com slash thumbs, get it. Also, Perfect. this is a long audiobook, so you're actually saving a lot of money. That's actually <laughs> really this one Who is to say? Audible is I a just great service, it up. though. I it's 56 say. hours of entertainment yeah, and yeah. Uh, I, incredible insight. So, I have listened to a lot of Audible in the past, too. It's just a great service. They're yep. good. Thanks, Audible. Thanks, Audible. Thanks, Audible. Audiblepodcast.com slash thumbs. Oh, don't mention it, Chris. Video. <laughs> I have to. Man, remember that time when Tim Schafer posted a picture of me from 14 years ago on the Double Fine website today? I do remember that. that was, what? Remember when you had hair? I remember no, that. No, I don't really. I don't. <laughs> when I first met you, you had hair. I know. I think I, I have very... What did you look like with hair? I, you can I, say, go to DoubleFine.com. I'm going to right now. Yeah. I, I sent that to Sarah because she always asked what you looked like with hair. Oh. And, I, and she didn't realize that you were in that photograph. That's amazing. There are times when, when me with hair looks more like me now. But, yeah, I know, I know. Man, yeah, it's weird to occasionally like remember really tangibly the sensation of having a comb and combing my hair. <laughs> like that's not a thing that I ever do. I haven't bought a right. comb in like of course. eight years or something. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, no. Double fine action news brought it all back. <laughs> Including it's... that shitty goatee. Oh, Dorks in around in the late nineties and early two thousands present even grosser facial hair than all guys have now, which is just a beard, <laughs> which is still already gross, says it's me with a beard. Bloodborne. I didn't know what Bloodborne was until like two days ago. Until the, until the world started exploding. Yes. So well, it made okay. me feel dumb. Well, so here's, here's, the, <laughs> here's the thing. So I had been seeing people freak out about Bloodborne for like a week. Mm-hmm. And and Sarah was like, oh, what's this like Bloodborne thing that everyone's talking about? And I'm like, oh, it's it's kind of like... This TF2 style game that Blizzard is making. <laughs> oh no! Oh and, yeah, no! Who thought. are you? I, right, that's what I thought for like two days, oh, and no. then and then I saw like Nels or someone like post something about it, and I'm like, wait a second, this is a PS4 game? Yeah. Only? Wait, what is this? I, wait, what is Dark Souls guys? Like, what? What is this? So then I like traced back through my like neurological pathway <laughs> to this, and I realized that I was thinking of that. That uh, I realized that I was thinking of the name Battleborn, oh, which is actually a Gearbox game that, to me and my brain, is similar to Overwatch, which is a Blizzard game. Yes. That is the one I was thinking of. So I was thinking of the wrong name and the wrong and developer Overwatch. and yeah. the wrong kind of game. 
entire everything I was thinking was wrong, but they were all sort of it's like a six degrees removed. Well, Bloodborne is not the most uh, descriptive title for an action game for a violent action game. Yeah, to be it's fair, just... one of the things confusing in my brain was called Battleborn. Yeah, so not not too far off the tree there. Anyway, yes. this is the new game from From Software. Yes, indeed. The direct by the specifically directed by the guy who directed Demon Souls and Dark Souls, but not Dark Souls Two. Correct. Yes. Yes, this has a long history. Well, not long, I guess. Demon Souls only came out in two thousand nine, but whatever. The the rich Video history. Games, um, yes, that's exactly. Long, I think at this it was point. a long long term commitment. Uh, this is an entirely new game in a new sort of fiction, so it's not in the Dark Souls world right uh this is uh, set in a victorian uh horror setting basically with so guns it was, there are definitely guns although they're not uh, very useful as guns actually they're only useful to sort of open an enemy up for a melee attack which is interesting okay. Uh, anyway, that sounds so, very dark. <laughs> yes, as far sounds... as the aesthetic of Bloodborne, I've been looking at this thing because I've been following it the last couple of days. the The best summary of Bloodborne was a tweet from Ollie Moss that said, "Someone described Bloodborne's aesthetic as Victorian Ed Hardy, and I wish they hadn't. <laughs> for now, that is all that I can see. Yeah, that um, is and that is accurate. <laughs> I very think. accurate. Yes, I. It looks like just, the key art that I've seen just looks like that shitty Van Helsing movie." <laughs> To me. That's what the it does a little bit. It reminds me of a of a humorless version of the goth faction in Brutal Legend, basically. Like that's oh, hmm. it's hearses and buggies and top hats and goth looking people. Only they're actually horrific freak of nature type folks running sure. around. Uh, the game is really good so far. Um, I have played at least a couple of hours. I've, I'm sort of doing a let's play with my colleague. He's actually driving most of it, but I have had my hands on the game to actually did you play, play it either, a bit. Did you play either of the Souls games? No, or I played... Three? Well, I guess I played a little bit of Demon Souls way back, like in 2010 I played, I played or so. a lot of Demon Souls. But you didn't, you didn't play any Dark Souls either of you? Okay. I played, no, no I, Dark Souls. Uh, I played a couple hours each of Dark Souls and Dark Souls 2, but okay. not as much as I played of the first You dipped game. a toe in to the yeah, Souls, yeah, yeah. Demon Souls, I played a, like many, many hours. Okay. Yeah. Well, this I played more Bloodborne than any of the other games okay. combined right. at this point so far. Um, you start it with character creation, which is nice always, um, and you actually sort of are picking not a class. You pick a a narrative background that actually determines your stats. So there's one uh, build called Waste of Skin where you have like horrible stats. There's the military veteran who has more experience point. You mm -hmm. know that kind of thing. Um, and then you awaken because this man with no eyes is giving you a blood transfusion in his medieval clinic. And then so there's not really so much else born. to go on. You're blood born. You're born in blood. Got it. And then there's not really Classic. much else to go on in terms of story. Like, there are certainly narrative things that are going on in this world, but like the Dark, like the Souls games, you know, I've researched them even though I haven't played that much of them. Uh, right. <laughs> you're just kind of on your own. You just figure out what's going on. Yep. You know, it's all sort of environmental so, storytelling, that goes, sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, and all of the items that you <clears throat> that you encounter, also you have no idea what, what they do or what they mean. You, it's a very very difficult game where you're kind of left to your own devices to to fend for yourself and figure out how to progress. Um, only with this really kind of Victorian Ed Hardy <laughs> aesthetic, right. yeah. which I actually I actually really like the way this game looks. It's it's really kind of goofy and and wacky, but it's. It's adding to the enjoyment for me, certainly. Like, there's something, something about it takes the sting away from how difficult the game is when it's, you know, huh, some some guy in a stovepipe hat with a blunderbuss who's running so that, after that's, you. So that's really interesting, actually, because one of the <clears throat> things I was thinking about just the other day, actually, yesterday maybe, was how intentional, like, whether it was intentional or not, that in the Souls games, this the... So yeah, I think one of the things that people really respond to with these games is that they don't even attempt to capture a lot of the things about sort of modern received wisdom in action game design sure. with respect to um, kind of player assistance and like smoothing things out. Um, and these games curve yeah, management. The, yeah, basically. these games very deliberately eschew that stuff and bring you a lot closer to the bone. It's like, it's like driving stick shift as opposed to, man sure. to automatic or something like you're, you're just like, 
you're much more in touch with everything your character is doing um, in the way that like fighting games are or, like certain other kinds of games, especially um, I would say Japanese games often were like that, especially in like the nineties and early two thousands. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I kind of always wondered if there was any intentional aesthetic, um, like deliberate marriage between that and what I thought was a really fascinatingly quaint and archaic setting, which sure. was like such a muted take on Western fantasy that it was practically medieval. And I don't mean medieval in the sort of modern Game of Thrones, like sexed up medieval. I mean like actually medieval, like dour, gray, muted, like just really uh, subdued in a way that was just fascinating <laughs> to me. And I, and it, there was something about that like quaintness that I, that I thought really spoke to the almost backwards looking. And I mean, this in a, in a positive way in the context of these games, sort of the almost backwards looking game design in the sense of sort of ignoring a lot of modern tropes of, uh, of action game, um, like sort of user experience style stuff. Um, I don't know, but I, I never can get a read on, and this is probably just cause I don't speak Japanese and I'm therefore not capable of actually reading like comprehensive interviews or anything with these designers sure. in their actual language. So, and translated interviews can, or interviews conducted through by like through an intermediary translator never really seemed to touch on super interesting topics or like if, yeah. if there, I would be really interested if people could point me towards interviews by, I guess Miyazaki is the guy, the name it of the is, guy who yeah. directed this game, like, or any of the other staff on the game that speak to this because I often with Japanese games, especially Japanese games that are a little off the beaten path design wise. In other words, like, not the latest Final Fantasy game or something, of which course. are like generally speaking, not like this. You, you know? mean like stuff like the Clover stuff from like two generations right. ago? Yes. Or exactly. I mean, it's a goofy example because it's obviously insane, but like or like sweary games, like yeah, sure, or like sure. Resident Evil Four when that came out. Yeah, like, that yeah. one specifically, like the games where it really feels like the person in charge deliberately took a different path. Design because so much of Japanese that was made clear like, by God Hand though, right? Oh, definitely, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Like, so I feel like so much of sort of AAA Japanese game design these days is very conservative. Not that that's not true of, of a lot of Western AAA game design as well. Um, but I, I just would be super, very, very curious to know how much of this, like, what the intention of some of this stuff is, and whether they ended up with a setting like that um, just because they did because someone thought it was cool. Like, sure. I don't know. Like, am I just making that up? I mean, I'm, it's just how I interpret it. So it doesn't really matter if I'm making it up or but not. But on this one, but apparently they did make uh, those choices just because someone thought it was cool because you're, there's weird stovepipe right. hat well, guys. That, that's yeah. what I mean, yeah. right? Because I look at this and even though it's kind of a, in some ways, a more, like, attractive looking game, it's kind of less interesting to me because it doesn't play against type as much. Like, it's less surprising to me to see a kind of wacky Victorian, like, gore thing did you like find something it, weirdly cryptic about the, the yes the early yes, style yes because those games are so withholding in in everything they're withholding in their uh in the amount of like text you get that explains the story or the mechanics or anything they're withholding in the like mechanical assistance you get um they're withholding with with like the number of hits you can take like it's just yeah, they're withholding with practically everything and so the just almost bizarrely restrained way everything looked and felt seemed totally in keeping with that to me. Um, it was, I, I just th found it very intriguing and like just unusual. You know, that is usually not the MO of art design in action games. It's just not, it's just not how they usually operate. And it seemed to me very, uh, co a very confident choice, but I don't know if it was confident or not. I don't know if it's just what they ended up with. And I interpret it. I'm, I'm just like creating all this stuff or if that was like any kind of deliberate intention. I, mean, I have no idea. I would like to know that as well. I mean, it's <clears throat> this certainly seems to be much more over the top, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and clearly. I mean, gameplay wise, this is actually dialed back even further uh, in some interesting ways. There's there's kind of no real magic use in this game. Like you you need to really 
engage in the melee combat or else right. you're, you're kind of screwed. Like yeah. this is, this is a game that is very much taking sort of one track of a soul's style. I read it. I saw a tweet from Greg Kasavin, mm. who's a, you know, the writer on Bastion and Transistor. And he, uh, he was saying that he felt like this game took even more from sort of fighting the lineage of fighting Japanese Absolutely. fighting games. Yeah. yeah. It feels very much like that. The rhythm of combat feels mm-hmm. very much like, Attack, retreat, attack, right, retreat. Yeah, yeah. Like in which was already, which was already pre- goes, which was already totally present in the sure, Souls games, but you're sure. saying they just doubled down on it that. It feels yeah. even more so. Yeah. I mean, because you're not really fighting with any ranged weapons as well. In right. This. So you you really are sort of face to face with your enemies yeah. at all times. I like that about this. Yeah, that's actually, cool. um I prefer that in, in mm-hmm. an action game of this style. Yeah. I, I'm also terrible at this game. <laughs> Hoping to get a little better, but um I don't know. It, it feels very pure, I guess, is, is the mm-hmm. way of putting it. And, uh, yeah. Art style aside, like the actual combat feels incredibly pure yeah. and incredibly difficult um, in a way that obviously, I mean, there's a lot to be said about the difficulty of these games and how they kind of hook people mm-hmm. in and how it's instead of having the, the carrot approach, the stick approach, I guess, right. uh, yeah. and <laughs> game design wise mm-hmm. uh, and and why that's popular right now is interesting uh and i couldn't answer that well I, I mean i think it's because of the the people who are theoretically interested in that have just not been catered to nearly sure. as much as they once were and so when anyone does anything along these veins it's already interesting and then if someone does it to a high degree of competency or mastery yeah like it's you know i mean it's like what else are you gonna get in this vein sure right sure. for like probably another year until they make another one like you know i mean and that's there's true. there's stuff that's this is not really the same in terms of it's a different take on it. But if you think of stuff like vanquish, there's kind of a like minor sub thread of this (laughs) kind of like intricate close up combat stuff that's come out of the God hand. If you go back a few more years, um, these things was way more of a, of a like brawler type situation. Yeah. Right. These are all different. These are all very different. Like actually I guess God hand and vanquish were the same guy. Um, Oh really? Okay. Right. Uh, That's also the resident evil four guy, right? I think so. I I could be wrong about all this. Um, but in any case, there were at least overlapping people. Sure. Um, but there's like, it's, it's interested, I think, in a lot of the same things that you're describing. But, yeah. you know, they, they these games tackle them in slightly different ways. But that's, that's kind of a weird, like, almost uh, counterculture, but still, like, high budget game. Sure. Where, you know, like, yeah, just the, 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 the um, spread between AAA and Indy and stuff is very different in Japan. You have these kind of weird companies is, yeah. like From and Clover that are often not really fully independent. Like and swear From, is, and, yeah. From is just owned by some just like Japanese conglomerate that also owns like refrigerator companies. And sure. stuff. Like it's not, yeah, they're yeah. not owned by like a media empire. They're owned by just a company that owns some other companies. And so they're kind yeah. of like an independent developer because they're not part of this like monolithic publishing empire. But they're not an independent studio either. Like the right, it, they, somebody's paying the bills, right? Like yeah, it, so they're, among, they they um, can afford art, right? Basically. Yeah, 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 exactly. So among <laughs> that kind of like mid-sized tier in Japan, this thread seems to be something that like a number of notable designers have been really interested in pursuing for the last several years in different ways. It's pretty fucking cool. Yeah, actually, I have to say, like, it, it, I don't have a PS4, so I can't play this thing. Oh, there's one outside. Okay. As we have one in our office, I guess. Also. <laughs> oh, yeah, or yeah, you we, should actually, actually. I don't know if we do anymore. I guess not. You could potentially look into it. I mean, if you're certainly only if you're interested. Um, I'm not I can't, I'm not at a point in my life where I can buy a, oh, a right. console a for 40 one game. Hour, also, <laughs> like a 40 hour difficult and yeah. involving kind of game as well. Um, but so far, I'm really enjoying it. I mean, again, I'm not I'm playing it with Patricia. I'm also playing it with my colleague. And like right. hands-on time is is only a portion of the time sure, I've spent course. with right. the game. Yeah, so, yeah. so you're um, also examining it. I'm also watching it very closely. Yeah, yeah. And sort of trying to understand how it all works. Mm-hmm. And all fits together. Mm-hmm. Um, but thus far, it's been a very good experience. I did a lot of that this, this weekend with City Skyline. <laughs> did, that's right. With, I've watched with, several different people. With uh, TO vlogs. God, I watched this like... <laughs> Eastern European guy of some, I don't know, like specifically where he's from, but he was just based on his accent and like his various things. He was very clearly sure. from somewhere in Eastern Europe. And yeah. he had the most like methodical approach. Like he was so that the, the Canadian guy I watched was also very methodical and very meticulous, but it was it his sort of method was 
I want to create a very like sort of natural, organic mm-hmm. seeming city, but I'm going to do it in a way that is like very careful. But I want the end result to feel as though it could actually exist in the real world, even though I'm being very careful with how yeah. I'm laying it out. Whereas this other guy that I watched, like everything was a perfect grid to the point that he like <laughs> – he never – would draw streets such that he would waste any like zone. He would never like overlap the sort of potential zoning areas in any streets. He would always have the exact like perfectly um, uh, calculated density for like every street Uh, like and just completely perfect, always 90 degree angle grids. Um, I I mean, and they were both very concerned with sort of traffic flow and so on, but like it's totally different. You know, totally different ways of approaching that. Yeah, Yeah, it was cool. It was uh, was a fun time watching this bullshit. Oh, it's good. It's not bullshit. It's it's great. Like, as with all things entertainment, if mm-hmm. you've given someone a reason to not want to jump off a bridge, you you've done a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's the final word fair, fair, on entertainment. Fair enough. <laughs> Infinite Jest is teaching me so much. Anyway. Oh, also, Chris, you'll probably remember this when I say the guy's name, but it's Shinji Mikami is the guy who did Resident Evil and Resident Evil Four and uh. God Hand and Vanquish and a okay, million, so, and, a million so, so games. and actually yes. also okay. the yes. the somewhat recent Last Falls, um, The Evil Within. Oh yeah, he did do the Evil oh, yeah. Within, which yeah. was maybe not quite as also, much. Also, I think of a... he was involved in Devil May Cry as well. Oh, maybe. somewhere in yeah, there. Yeah, he was one of those guys who was like just everything in Capcom of that era. That guy yeah. seems like he touched. Yeah, but the guy who I think was like really more pivotal to, to Devil May Cry, like ended up doing Beautiful Joe and like some other. Oh. Okay. Yeah, uh, the, like these two guys, though, platinum they, they, and clover stuff. Yeah, because because well, Godhand was a clover game as well. I think, right. or yeah. was it? Clover yes. was, a, was a subsidiary was a, of Capcom. Yes, yeah, so it was like the anyway, last right? clover yeah. game. I think maybe. Mm. R.I.P. Before they made before they made did, platinum games. Yeah, yeah, I think this guy also did PN03, which was not a good game. Oh, I never actually played that. Product that was one of those GameCube three. like. Yeah. Yeah, that was when it was like a dance action shooter. Yeah, when Capcom went all in on the GameCube for a while there. Right, right, right. Uh, okay, so that was an awesome time to own a GameCube. <laughs> it really I was. Mean, let's be honest. Resident all times Evil. are an awesome time to GameCube own a GameCube. Was yeah, great. GameCube was great. Really GameCube was awesome. Also, I still think that the Resident Evil Four controlled best on the GameCube controller. Yeah, I liked playing that on GameCube a lot. Uh, all right, so one of the all-time best systems. Um, Edmund Digman writes, or I'm sorry, Edward Digman writes. Hi, thumbs. Still good. As a kid, my parents didn't like video games, and I did most of my game playing at other people's houses. One of my close friends had a computer, so we would play PC games at his house. The PC games don't really support co-op play, so we, we had to get a little creative. At age 9 or 10, we played Star Wars Jedi Knight Jedi Academy, and to make sure we both got to play, and because our hands were too small to reach all the keybinds and we didn't know how to rebind <laughs> keys, uh, we made substantial progress into the game with one person controlling the mouse and the other person controlling the keyboard. Yes, That's It awesome. was surprisingly effective and required a lot of frantic back-and-forth communication to do things like using the Force, which required you to aim with the mouse and then hit a button on the keyboard. Or doing any kind of platforming. We did the same thing with the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion several years later with about, <laughs> wow, with about the same degree of success. And although we had to lower the difficulty eventually, that was more the fault of the game's level scaling than our teamwork. I'm still friends with him to this day, and he listens to Idle Thumbs too, so I'm sure he'll recognize this incredibly specific anecdote, unless playing games like this is a lot more common than I thought. I love the show and would love to hear if you guys have any thoughts, examples, or anecdotes of novel multiplayer systems, either developer intended or otherwise. All the best, Ed. Oh, that's, that's a beautiful story. That's actually kind of heartwarming. Like, that's a true friend that you can yeah. actually, like, communicate yeah. with to that point. I hope sure. that the friend is able to tell that we read his friend's email because you started with his name. <laughs> <laughs> right then, he perked up. He's like, oh, yeah, this is going to be about me. Um, I feel like I did some weird things. Yeah, I feel like I, I feel like kid. younger younger era co-op weirdness is the sort of thing that I would have probably done. But actually, okay, like... The only time that I ever actually remember doing that was going to, like, my dad's friend's house from college who had video games before we did in our house when I was probably eight, seven, and my brother was five. Um, And, you know, like, we were really, really young. And I just remember, like, but this was, like, what every kid did probably at that era with a brother was tag team Robotron 2084 because that game you needed uh, two yeah. Atari oh, joysticks okay. to play it. I actually remember doing that when the Xbox 360 came out, of all things. Did oh, that's you, awesome. With Geometry it had, Wars? No, with Robotron because it, oh. it was one of the original. When, remember when Xbox Live Arcade was actually, like, yeah. our classic arcade In games? An arcade. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I remember. I can't remember with who I did it with. but I yeah. Man, dual stick Robotron over Xbox Live would be hilarious. Oh, man, yeah. <laughs> Although you could also do that with Geometry Wars, so that would be fucking impossible. Yeah. That said, man, 
there are there were some people um on the um Awesome Games Done Quick stream who were doing there were one of the things in this year's Awesome Games Done Quick speedrunning thing was people playing Portal like this, where one guy did the mouse oh, and one shit. guy did the controller, yeah. wow. and they were also doing like exploits and quick moves through the game, where they had practiced basically acrobatic routines together, where they're like, okay, one, oh two, three, God. and then they do all the like, and it, <laughs> I think it was Portal. Fuck, I hope it was Portal. It was, it was some game of that type of like a right. really dexterous first person thing, and I'm, I'm nearly positive that it was Portal, but played exactly like this with one person right, on right, a wasp right. and jump and whatever, and one person <gasps> shooting and looking crazy that's amazing yeah oof that's gross to think about yeah it's really cool i love it i can't think of anything off the top of my head but i i feel this this has rung a bell that i would would have done something yeah. goofy like that this guy and his friend should kid. go and look through awesome games done quick yes and then man they should fucking practice up on yeah, their je- on their jedi knight jedi knight two or person was it jedi knight or jedi academy that they played uh, uh, I already. Not that it matters. It's... I think it was both. It's Jedi Knight, Jedi Academy. Is that a thing? Jedi Knight. Well, yeah, because as we all know, it is Star Wars, Dark <laughs> Forces, then Dark Forces Two, Jedi Knight, and then Jedi oh. Knight Two, Jedi Academy. <laughs> um, oh my god! God, there was one more after that. I thought maybe there wasn't. I thought there was. I thought they couldn't resist. Oh, I I might be missing one. That they're, series they're... just could not stop naming itself. Yeah. It was. It was complex nomenclature. It was stupid. <laughs> uh, all right. So let's see. What else do we have here? Um, another classic childhood perception. Yes. Mike Steele writes, hey, Thumbs, on episode 201, someone wrote in and mentioned thinking that the thief's sprite looked like it had a weird trunk. What it was an elephant. Yeah. Final Fantasy? It was from Final Fantasy, yeah. I think. Yeah. Oh, my God. Sorry. It was Dark Forces, then Dark Forces 2 Jedi Knight, then Jedi Knight 2 Jedi Outcast. Oh, my God. And then... And those were all different engines. And then after that was Jedi Academy. Sorry, they could not stop. <laughs> anyway, let's. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Sorry, that's, that's sorry, fine. everyone. Yeah, that's no. pretty good. Stupid. So that's like Dark Forces six or something. No, it's five. dark. It's Dark Forces four. Okay. Jedi Knight three. Jedi. Uh, what's it's the, like the Rambo what's naming one? system. <laughs> Jesus. First Blood. Jedi Outcast two. First Jedi Blood, Academy. First... Yeah. And there's also the spinoff Mysteries of the Sith. Oh my god. <laughs> Dash Rendar came out of that crazy no Dash, time stuff right no Dash, or during that like Dash time... Rendar is from shadows of the empire right this is kyle, kyle katarn and the moldy crow is uh, i thought there the was a crossover crow. that's the name of his area ship. the moldy Between crow them. yeah what a, what a great name. name yeah oh, what a great name what a moldy is that crow. just like classic sort of ex- just sort of expanded universe bullshit where you just take the one that was in the original star wars and it's like oh it's like a word and then an and like a yep. bird so you just yep. change one of them because that's how they all must be so named because like that one of them was an even worse so they must falcon. always be like yeah. that millennium falcon uh all right so mike Steele writes on episode 201 someone wrote in and mentioned thinking that the thief's sprite looked like it had a weird trunk because he was a kid and his brain is weird it reminded me of the same thing i did in final <laughs> fantasy yep. 6 three here in america with this character of emperor gestal when I first played the game, for some reason, my dumb kid eyes saw his sprite as a weird hybrid dog-faced man. <laughs> but since it was a fantasy game with a plot involving people that were part human and part monster, it didn't stand out as weird. I went through the entire game thinking that the leader of the antagonistic empire in this game was a giant talking dog person. <laughs> as an adult, I can now tell he just, like, has a beard and long hair. But to this day, <laughs> because of my ill-informed younger self... It's very difficult not to look at the sprite and instantly see him as a dog-faced monster king. I'm oh. glad to see I'm not the only one who has a weird sprite story involving a Final Fantasy character. Keep up the great show, Mike Steele, Las Vegas. Oh, that's so good. I love those things. <laughs> so I definitely I definitely had a lot of affection for um I yeah. Whatever the people were doing in Paperboy, Oh like, man, yeah. I guess uh, I always thought it was break dancing. Oh, it's gotta be break dancing. I don't know I what he was actually are. doing. No, they were actually yeah, break, dancing. break dancing. And people in Paperboy yeah. are all doing pretty notable yeah, it's just things. Like, yeah, <laughs> weird shit goes on. I just, man, I have to say, have you guys played Paperboy with the like handlebar controllers at any time recently? No. I, I there's like a classic arcade expo that comes to the Bay Area every year, and I haven't been to it in a few years. But but we used to go once every couple of years, I guess, and like. And the last couple times I was there, I played a bunch of Paperboy in, in the in the with original the bike cabinet with the bike, with the bike oh controls. It's so fun. That's I such bet, a good yeah. game with that with those controls. It's I, shockingly entertaining. I remember because being, very being able to turn that quickly is probably what actually makes it possible to yeah. be enjoyable, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. 
because it's because it's analog. You can like slam the wheel. Yeah, it's great. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's just cool. It's cool. That sounds like a so good if you time. were going to buy one cabinet, it would be Clax. But if you were going to buy two, it would be. <laughs> if you're going to buy two, it's Clax and Rampart. If you're going to buy three, it's Clax, Rampart, and Paperboy. Yeah, that's there that's a go. solid. Uh, that is an amazing collection yeah, of games right there. Like, that's a personal three, arcade that. Yeah, yeah, for I would, sure. I would get Crazy Taxi. I really, really loved Crazy Taxi. I never played that I never, game. I, never I only, play, I only played, played Dreamcast. Dreamcast. Yeah. I mean, I played it quite a bit on Dreamcast as well, but it was also very fun. In the yeah. Dreamcast was all Crazy Taxi and Rush 2049. That looked the two oh, games oh, I played on Oh, for me, it was, it was Crazy yeah. Taxi and SSX. I played that on the GameCube. Okay. And there's a lot of Well, actually, was SSX well? on the I don't Dreamcast? know. I played Tricky on thinking, the GameCube. Okay, yeah. That's I guess it was. I guess for us, the big three were Tony Hawk, SSX, and Crazy Taxi. Sure. And that was our like late night... Pizza. Yes. Man, so that also that is the so era good. and the console of just one point perspective moving quickly around yeah. things. Yes. Like that's just what yep. you do. Yep. I guess. Because I also think of Quake Three as being a Dreamcast a notable appearance. <laughs> sure. Right. Sure. You could play against PC players. I yeah, that was a crazy thing. When in uh, Dreamcast had VGA out. I know. It did. I was so tempted. I was in my my childhood home in Rhode Island this weekend. I was Boy, so I'm tempted saying. to bring my my Dreamcast back. Oh, to yeah. do some streaming and such, but you know, I guess that wouldn't be that hard. No, it probably wouldn't be. Yeah, if you Just have a capture a box. Cable. Yeah, I have a capture box. So yeah, yeah. could make it work. I'm sure. That's cool. Maybe next time I'll be there again soon. All right. Uh, so Ryan Hoover writes, "Hey, thumbs. I was listening to the episode where you discussed Infinifactory and Space Chem. I'm behind <laughs> on my podcast. You wondered if any knowledge of organic chemistry gives an advantage in playing Space Chem. I had just graduated college when Space Chem came out and eagerly bought it." Thinking that my degree in organic chemistry would confer some type of advantage. It didn't. <laughs> After graduating, I started working in manufacturing, designing production lines, which I did up until December 2014. One month after I finished doing that, Infinifactory came out. I thought to myself, I will be good at this game, given my extensive knowledge of this field. I was wrong. I feel like Zachtronics is secretly following my life and making games that make me feel underqualified for what I do or did. Given the current trend, their next game will be about financial analysis that will be released when I move to a different job. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's really good. That's really awesome. <clears throat> uh, Ari Anderson writes, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that name correctly, uh, but this person writes, Dear Idle Thumbs, I'm listening to your podcast from the beginning. I would like to write in, but I'm worried I have no idea what the cast is like in 2015. I could check, but I don't want to spoil the journey. So I'm writing this from the past, predicting what the future holds. Where I am, Chris Remo is taken to DayZ. He sounds quite fond of it, and I imagine that due to its likeness to Far Cry 2, with their emergent stories and unpredictable events, Mr. Remo will get on the survival sim rabbit hole. In the far future of 2015, I expect he'll be one of those guys who's really into Rust and H1Z1. Uh, I fear for him. Someone should tell him survival sims, sims are just MMORPGs and new rapping. I don't agree with that at all. <laughs> Even though I'm not, have not gone down the rabbit hole that he predicts. <laughs> Sean has, but for very different reasons than you would ever play yes. an MMO. Yes. If he likes H1Z1 so much, just go play the feature complete version Ultima Online. Hmm. I think Mr. Rodkin sounds like a really sweet dude, and I feel sad for him when people call him derogatory things like Big Bird or David Cage. How many episodes <laughs> in is this guy? Uh, 143? Did I, did I just make that up? Why did I just say that? I, I think I just know. made that up. I think you made it That's up. That's a lot. That's too many episodes. There's no yeah, way. No, there's I think not, he's yeah. pretty early in. This yeah. has to be like in the double yeah. digits. Um, I think Mr. Rodkin sounds like a really sweet dude, and I feel sad for him when people call him derogatory things like Big Bird or David Cage. Hopefully the 2015 documentary, I Am Big Bird, will finally settle the question, is Jake Rodkin <laughs> Big Bird? <laughs> Steve Gaynor strikes me as a person who all eyes turn to when he enters a room. That's actually That's true. That's correct. Yeah. I like him, but I would not be surprised if he's exiled in 2015 after having tried to take over the cast with his natural charm and authority. Please all get along in the future, too, guys. That definitely did happen. So that, I'm uh, glad that yep. we moved Steve that, to Portland that occurred. where he made a successful indie game yep. after we kicked him off the show. I haven't gathered a whole lot from yes. Sean Vanneman on, on the podcast because I confuse his voice with everyone else. I like that he doesn't confuse the other people for Sean. He just confuses Right. Sean. Only Sean. Well, Sean is the new guy still that's, in this guy's true. reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he has a nice name, though. I hope he keeps showing up on the cast so I can get a better picture of him, too. This guy's in for a treat. Yeah, so this has to be around sure episode. Like, oh, this man. This guy's not in for a treat. Nick Brecken is my favorite guy on the oh. cast. He's always so nice to people, and he gives off good vibes. He probably even smells nice. I really hope all is well with Nick him in 2015 nice. and that he doesn't get consumed by Dota. Thanks for casting. You guys rock. Best wishes are uh, era. He he has that, like, Aria? IPA pronunci pr like, pronunciation phonetic thing but i've never known how to read those they those neither are always on I. wikipedia pages neither do i uh, you know right they're like the, weird the symbols yeah, yeah and yeah. i don't know how to say them so i still can't say is it right. a guy for sure you don't know. i don't know i have no idea 
this person, this man or woman or, or anyone else, I don't know how to say your name. I'm they, sorry. Yo, they don't know you exist. I know they don't. I know they have no idea totally that you're a don't. person. They don't know I'm real. <laughs> It's they amazing. don't know that you used to be Nick Brecken. I used to be Nick <laughs> Brecken. It's true. That's why I was just like, Nick smells pretty nice. It's good. Yeah. There you All go. Snap. It's good. Um, cool. What else do we have here? Let's see. Oh, maybe that's it. Maybe that's all we have for now. That feels like a good place. That was a good, that was that a good, a good kind place. of fun closing note. Yeah, I think so. Chris, what do you think Idle Thumbs is going to be like in 2022? What kind of games am I going to like? It's the same ones you like now. <laughs> oh. Murder, She Wrote, the game. <laughs> Just Murder, She Wrote. <laughs> Just Murder, She Wrote. I, I, was in a, uh, I went to my friend's wedding in the gold country, and uh, we went to this little diner downtown of some, you know, just dumpy old west town that looks like a movie set, but is a real old town. I love that scene. And um, they had... The board game 221B Baker Street, which is apparently a really bad Sherlock Holmes board game. And they also had Murder, She Wrote the board game. Oh, my God. Which is probably terrible. I'm sure it's terrible. But, man, it exists. And it has an amazingly just disgusting bad board game art painting of Angela Lansbury on the cover. Yes. And then the rest of the cover, if I remember correctly, looked like a bad, um, just like a bad Agatha Christie novel. It was like a really oh, old perfect. timey car and some stuff where just like obviously they didn't know what the cover should be because yeah. they don't know what Murder, She Wrote is. But they put, they had a picture of Angela Lansbury that they gave to the painter and said, paint this. <laughs> you like, do it in two hours. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, you have today. Give me a painting. Are you looking uh, up Murder, She Wrote board game right now, Chris? Yes, I am. But uh, for some reason, it's not working. Oh, no. Yeah. All you need to type into Google Image Search is Murder, She Wrote Board Game. and you'll, It's basically Angela no, but Lansbury. No, nothing. It's a blank screen. Oh, me. no. It's a picture of Angela Lansbury in front of Maniac Mansion, basically. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, there's a murderer running on the cover as well. So just so everyone knows, um, you'll know because this week's episode art will be this. It will not be. But uh, <laughs> here, Chris. Oh, oh that's my good. God. This just looks like... This looks like art that someone designed <laughs> specifically to be able to be down res to like 320 <laughs> by 200 and then be an NES start screen. Yeah, no, Angela right. Lansbury or, or like, looks really... It's like if you are if you are playing a Nintendo game of Murder, She Wrote, and then you need to get a tip from Jessica Fletcher, this yes. art becomes the sprite art that only has like a blink animation, and that's all. And then like when she gets <laughs> mad, it can cut to angry face. Yes. Right. Yeah, like yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. A, like a Monkey Island one close-up. I yeah. have to say, uh, for $199 on eBay, you can get Angela Lansbury autographed Murder, she wrote oh my god game. i told you guys right about the time i tried to get yes! umberto echo to sign the board game of the name of the rose yes. yes okay never mind right before we played that game back in boston you you told that amazing uh, okay. story and it was did incredible. i tell them the podcast over wait the, uh, the murder i think you should tell it just in case people hadn't heard it because it's uh, pretty good well. i think so, it's good umberto echo is the is like one of my favorite authors he wrote the name of the rose and foucault's pendulum and uh recently the Prague cemetery and also like several other novels and he's also like written a million essays and things uh uh the name of the rose is like an absolutely incredible book it's set in a in a franciscan abbey i guess i can't remember actually what the, i think so yeah what the order of monks is but it's set in an abbey with this like monk character who's kind of a like and it's medieval yeah it's medieval yeah. and he's sort of a sherlock holmes stand-in kind of but it's like a weird like deconstruction of uh, like a like a mystery story, like a it, it really interesting thing. It's kind of anyway, a who, yeah, who done it in yeah, kind that of, setting. but it's like a like but it's smarter than that, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Anyway, so um, there's a board game based on the name of the rose, uh, and it says Umberto Echo, the name of the rose board game, and the board game is like it's actually really fun. Like it's I great. thought it was, it yeah, was really it's a good game. good game, and like I don't really know like why someone decided that was going to be licensed as. Oh, also, they made this into a movie with Sean Connery and Christian Slater. Yeah, it's, like it's actually mid eighties movie. It's pretty yeah, decent. It's also yeah. pretty good. Yeah. Uh, anyway, this book was enough of a phenomenon in like nineteen eighty four or like in you know the years surrounding its release. It sold like millions of copies, so they licensed a board game for it. I guess. I think I might be the person who introduced Umberto Eco to the fact that this board game exists <laughs> yes. because I took it with me to a book signing for the Prague. I brought my like hardcover copy of the Prague Cemetery and I brought my copy of uh, the name of the Rose board game, which is still in print as far as I know. Like yeah. I bought it like a few weeks before then. Like sure. it's not like I had this like in a dusty cabinet somewhere. And I, <laughs> and so I get to the front of the line and I give him my like, 
book copy and he signs it and then I bring this out and he just kind of looks at it and he's like oh, what? And I'm like uh, could, could you sign this? And he's like I uh, I cannot sign this. Uh, it is uh, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> he just would not. He like was totally baffled. Like there's no flicker of recognition yeah. and that was it. Nope. I, which I actually really respected because sure. that is not like that is not how people operate at press drunkards. No, usually like oh yeah sure it's put like, my name oh, on it. Whatever. Yeah right. Okay I looked up I went to Board Game Geek and looked up the Murder, She Wrote board game. Yeah. Um, the, 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 there's, I, I also read some of the comments about it. Um, it has a 5.78 out of 10, which is not awesome, but Board Game Geek also grades really, really hard. So like that's, yeah, that's not terrible. That's not too terrible. Yeah. The yeah. premise of this game is actually the most outrageous Murder, She Wrote episode ever, <laughs> which I'll read the description here first, and then I went and found some explanations okay. in the forum. Right. Okay, so yes. this is... It's actually kind of cool because it's it's one player has a hidden identity. Um, one as play- Jessica Fletcher. No one person. No, okay, it's way better than that because it's the opposite of that. One. Okay, and I will explain this in a second. One player is secretly and randomly chosen to be the murderer, and the rest are detectives. Parentheses Jessica Fletcher. <laughs> Trying to determine which player is the this murderer. This is like the Casino Royale 1960s thing, where everyone yes. is James Bond. Yes, this yes. is this is this. Okay, so this game is actually like a Thomas Crown Affair reverse situation, <laughs> where it's an island, and everyone on it is basically Jessica Fletcher, and you're trying to figure out which one of you is not, because the the, the murderer <laughs> player wins if he or she can murder five witnesses, which are NPC, just like spaces right. on the board, I guess, and escape off the game board, which is the island, before he slash she is discovered. A detective player, Jessica Fletcher, wins <laughs> by being the first to correctly deduce the identity of the murderer. So it's like the everyone one who's not her. So everyone yeah, is Jessica yeah. Fletcher except the murderer who is disguised as Jessica <laughs> Fletcher. Are they all orange? Play, yeah, pl- players mark which locations they have visited and in which order. This information, along with the living or dead status of the witnesses, is used by detective players to deduce who the murderer is. That's also like an awesome game that's as a really game. Good. Like that's really I good. Hope, yeah. I hope that this like fictional decision was imposed. With no room for debate by a cigar chopping executive <laughs> who said nobody Jessica wants to Fletcher. buy the Murder She Wrote board game and not play as Jessica Fletcher <laughs> unless they're a murderer. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the, the um, there's actually uh, a thread on here with someone saying, "Okay, I bought this game because this seemed quirky and like proposing a couple really like." really sort of simple tweaks that you can do to the rules to make it actually play pretty well because the I, I actually like games like this where everyone it, it, it presents as everyone has the same abilities but secretly there's one person on the board yeah, right. who is deceiving yep. what a hilarious thing for it to be murder she wrote though yes. where it is six Jessica Fletcher's <laughs> on an island and one of them is actually a murderer in disguise I mean I don't know if that's really the case but it says <laughs> the other ones are detectives parentheses so Jessica this. Fletcher <laughs> God, imagine the computer game adaptation of this, where there are just six Angela Lansbury's all voiced it's by just Angela Lansbury. Spy Party, yeah, like, yeah, really, it is. It is like it is. It is kind of like Spy Party, but it's again reverse Spy Party. Right? Yeah, yeah. Weird. It's it's, it's <laughs> Angela Party. Yeah, Man. all Angela's all. Now the time. I want to own this game. I really do now. After this. 150 bucks or whatever, get one autographed well, by Angela Lansbury. Well, 199 Oh, 199 So that means you can probably get a non-autographed copy, like, pretty affordable. Yeah, but it's probably, probably not a good game, also, really. Yeah, but... But then you can frame that box art. It might be worth it. <laughs> Wait, 1985 Murder, She Wrote board game. Okay, I'm taking a look at this. 10 bucks at ecrater.com. Okay, well, so just fucking let's get this bullshit. Okay. It looks like Candyland, like the board. Yep. <laughs> Have you seen this? It's amazing. Anyway. There's no way it's good. Anyway. No, I mean, obviously not. If you have a question for us, write us at questions at idlethumbs.net. Mm-hmm. Um, you want to go through the list of, of sure, your yeah. favorite things? We're on Twitter as well, at idlethumbs. Our website is idlethumbs.net slash idlethumbs. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash idlethumbs. And if you like the show, please tell a friend. It is the only way we grow the show, and we really appreciate it when you do that. It means a lot to us. Also, um, we are on Twitch. Danielle yeah. streams a bunch of stuff at twitch.tv slash idle thumbs. Mm-hmm. And if you want to watch annotated copies of our oh, yeah. episodes, they are on YouTube with time jumps to every discussion topic, which is youtube.com slash idle videos. And while we're here talking about idle thumb stuff, we should, it's, we should uh, <clears throat> plug some crap. We should. Yeah. Gross. Let's do that. <laughs> Man, actually, okay. Quick diversion. <laughs> the idle thumbs forums, which this is actually, this is, 
This is both a plug and a reason maybe why you shouldn't go to the Idle Thumbs forums. The Idle Thumbs forums is an amazing community that's been around as long as the site, which is over a decade at this point. Yeah. Um, but they have a, a thread because it sort of came up at one point ages ago about whether or not people should be able to like plug per, yeah. self promote personal projects. So there's now a catch all thread. There has been for years, but the catch all thread because Idle Thumbs forum thread names are always bad. Is called plug your shit. Yes, yeah. it is. <laughs> the end. That's all. Yep. So, so now we're, we're going to plug, plug our shit. Plug our plug shit. Plug your yeah. shit. So we have a a new. Uh, so as you may or may not know, actually, if you listen to this podcast, um, we actually, in addition to uh, hosting this show, uh, we also operate a podcast network that includes other. Really great shows. Like, the fact that we have to preface this means that we are bad at promotion. I know we never do this. We're not good at, at, at promoting ourselves. But um, uh, these other podcasts that we host include Three Moves Ahead, which is the uh, premier strategy game podcast on the internet. Uh, we have um, Twin Peaks Rewatch, which is a show Jake and I do where every week, as earlier we, uh, discussed on this episode, yes, <laughs> we discussed yes. an episode of the uh, early '90s show Twin Peaks. Uh, we have Terminal Seven, which is hosted by uh, Nels Anderson. And uh, Jesse, never remember his Jesse's friend. Last name. Uh, and his buddy. This is dedicated to the incredibly popular card game Netrunner. Um, we have Designer Notes, which is a long form um, game development interview show hosted by Soren Johnson, the designer of the recent Off World Trading Company, as well as Civilization Four. And we have the sort of irregularly posted Dota Today, which is hosted by Sean and sort of a couple other uh, rotating uh, people that is all about Dota, obviously. Um, Their most recent episodes have been actually really intense interviews with like professional players and commentators and people who are really actually pretty deep into the Dota 2 Pro scene. Like, that, that show has kind of become a weird interview show with yeah, personalities yeah. at this point. Yeah, yeah. He's, cool. lining, he's lining up some more uh, good interviews with people from that community now, which is cool. Um, so anyway, uh, as, you, as you know, um, this podcast, Idle Thumbs, is uh, ad supported. That's what allows us to pay the bills. Uh, but we are today. We today launched a new feature uh, on our store at store.idlethumbs.net, where you can buy uh, personal or commercial kind of short mentions um, on um, three moves ahead, on um, Dota today, and on Twin Peaks and Terminal Rewatch, 7. and on Terminal Seven. Um, so. These are basically much cheaper than you would spend for a sort of traditional, like, big ad buy. And it's just to get a short message out if you want to wish a friend happy birthday or make fun of them, trash talk them, <laughs> or, or make like, a host of one of those podcasts say something very strange. Right. Um, or, or, like, if you, like, I don't know, released some music that you want to, like, get the word out about. Um, uh, that is also with it. Like, just any. If you want to plug thing. your shit. If you want to plug your shit, this yeah. is the place to do it. Uh, go to store.idlethumbs.net. We're calling these on-air mentions. There's also a cut rate if you want to buy an uh, uh, an on-air mention that is across all of those shows as well. Right. So if you want to make all of those people say something, uh, <laughs> you're, you're welcome and encouraged to do such a thing. <laughs> yep. So uh, we are. this is basically a thing we're just trying. We don't know if this is going to work. We don't know if people will want to do this. Um, but it seemed like a way that we could help the other shows that we host um, – get give a little bit back to their to the people who make those shows possible um and so if you would like to support them directly because you like those shows this is a very easy and straightforward way to do it awesome so yeah store.idlethumbs.net uh and go to on air mentions it's on the front page and uh it's pretty easy and just we have some guidelines there we you know we no nudity no, <laughs> no verbal nudity no no um, Abuse, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nothing like it should use your best judgment. Anyway, uh, that's that. Let's wrap this up. Thanks for listening. You're welcome, Chris. Thanks for being here. You're Thank welcome, you Danielle. for being a friend. Oh, thanks. Thank you for being a friend. Thank you. See you guys next week. Sounds okay. good. <laughs> Bye. 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 Uh, good night. Uh, uh, uh.